All right, welcome everybody. It's really great to see all these faces in the audience. This is School Fuel's fifth time doing a candidate's debate for school board. It, uh, we've been doing it for more years than that, but we've had a couple cycles that were uncontested. Um, so we've had, this will be our fifth contested election where we've hosted the candidate's debate. So I wanna thank the School Fuel Board for putting this together. Um, and the advisory council, many of whom are here in the audience. Raise your hand, Elizabeth. There we go. I want to thank Quest. They've been very generous every time we've done this to allow us to have our event here. Um, Novato Community TV is here. Um, they've filmed it for us every year. At the end of the evening, I will be announcing what the rebroadcast schedule will be. So you can pass that around um, to friends and family who can't be here tonight if they want to watch. Um, and just as a little footnote, the um, League of Women Voters um, candidate forum that all the candidates participated in, there's a link that's live so you can go to that and watch um, the debate that they did um, for the League of Women Voters also. Um, our timekeeper, Amy in the front, um, She's your best friend, or not, or depending not. on how verbose you <laughs> decide to be. Um, and I want to thank all the community. I see lots of face. I see staff. I see parent um, advocates. I see some students in the audience. So it's great. And I hope more people will trickle in as we, as we move along. OK, some housekeeping matters. Um, we're doing it a little differently this year. We, we um, in the effort to um, make sure that the student voice is represented, so we have added student moderators to the evening. Our student moderators, I will introduce them in all their fabulousness in a moment, but they're gonna help me moderate tonight. They're gonna ask some of your questions. Um, so I hope you're filling out your index cards. We have runners going up and down the aisle with index cards, so as you hear, answers, you, it may spark a question, a follow-up question, or something you hadn't thought of. So please, we're going to be here a while. Hopefully we have enough questions to be here the full time. I think it's important that we are an informed voting body. So hopefully we make it the whole evening. We have enough questions. Um, the candidates are all going to get a one-minute opening statement. They're going to get 90 seconds for um, their answers to every question. If it looks like a particular question is complicated enough that we haven't fully flushed out um, a good answer in that amount of time, and, and that would be as a whole, not because one person isn't quite getting their words together, but as a whole, if we haven't really flushed it out, we have, we have the discretion to add 30 seconds to that particular question. Um, closing statements not to exceed three minutes. Hopefully you will use a lot less. I watched you give one minute closing statements today, so I know it's possible. Um, keep your mic up so that it broadcasts well um, to the TV. Um, the candidate who goes first was randomly selected, and so Debbie's the lucky winner. She, <laughs> she's going to uh, be the first to give her opening statement and the first to um, answer the first question and then she'll pass to the right so and then it'll just at that point just cycle all the way around um, and now I'd like to introduce our students first we have Romario Conrado he's a senior at Novato High School he's a scholar at the Summer Math and Science Honors Academy at Stanford he's a GED math instructor he's the chair of Novato High's site council and to top that all off, he's ASB student body president. So it was Mario. Thank you for being here. And our San Marin um, senior is Bilal Mubarak. Bilal is chair of the Marin County Youth Commission. He's president of San Marin High's speech and debate team. So uh -oh. beware. <laughs> And he's the lead attorney for San Marin's uh, mock trial team. And to top that all off, he's a national merit scholar. So we have some wonderful students here um, to help us moderate the evening. And with that, we're gonna get started. So Romaro, you're gonna go first. Opening statements. Okay. 
Hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, thank you to School Fuel and, for this opportunity and Novato Community Television for making this available tonight and beyond for people who couldn't make it tonight. I'm Debbie Butler. Uh, for me, this is probably the most important forum that we participate in as, as candidates. We've talked to the newspaper. We've talked to political parties. But tonight, we're talking to the community who cares deeply about public education. So this is important. A little bit about me. For the past nine years, I've served as a trustee for the Novato School Board. I currently serve as the board president for the second time, and I was selected as the Marin County Trustee of the Year in 2014, and I've also served as Marin County School Board Association president for two years. My husband, Gary, and I have lived in Novato for 15 years. We have two great kids, and we've, they've gone through Novato schools uh, by way of Hamilton, San Jose, and Novato High. Uh, our son has just graduated from Novato High, and our daughter is currently a sophomore in Novato High, and I'm almost at a minute already, which was not told in our email, so I'm just going to say a few more things. Okay. Um, besides having children still in our schools, which I believe is important to provide that balance on the board, I bring experience and decisive leadership, and I've demonstrated the commitment that it takes to be a board member by being active, informed, and engaged. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Mack. Oh, we're going this way. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, right. Not to your right. Okay. You guys go. Mr. Hamovitz. And you're positive. And I'm positive. Uh, hello, good evening, and thank you all for being here. Uh, given the restricted time, I just want to uh, say a brief few things. That you are the people, you people here in the audience, who make a difference. And you should ask yourselves if you're actually happy with the way the school board handles district decisions and transparency and community outreach. I've spoken to a lot of parents around the district, and everybody feels the district could do a better job of outreach, they could do a better job of transparency, and they could include the community more in decision-making process. We have a community that approved the parcel tax by over 80%. We have a community that supports the teachers, that is willing to volunteer, and yet we have a school board that seems to act in isolation. So. I'm, on, I'm running for school board in, in order to open the school board up to the community, to bring transparency to it, and to have a wider community feel to the school district. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Millerick. Thank you to School Fuel um, for the evening and um, Nevada Television. Um, I'm um, running for school board for the additional four years. I believe the next four years are pivotal in what we can do for Nevada. We have a new superintendent and leadership at the district office that is very strong and effective. We have new budget opportunities that are coming across the state, including Novato. And we have new curriculum instruction methodologies and teacher support that are being implemented in the district. This, this next four years will transform education in Novato. Um, we have teacher support and technology to make this possible. I want to be part of this transformation and deliver Novato, the promise that we've been working on for the past uh, decade. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Cooper. Thank you. I want to thank uh, School Fuel especially and uh, the two of you for coming tonight. It's uh, great. It's a very important thing that you're involved with your schools, and I appreciate that. I've served as a trustee in the school district here for the past eight years. I have two great daughters, and they've both gone through the entire school system, including going, graduating from Novato High. I'm committed to this district and its success. When making a decision, I get the facts, and then in an objective way, and looking through the lens of what's best for student learning, try to make a sound decision. You will see me out at the schools from time to time, visiting classrooms and checking in with teachers and principals, hearing about their successes and new ways that the district can improve instruction. We are a very diverse community, as we, you all know. And I feel strongly that we give all of our students a very challenging and rigorous uh, instruction. Uh, I will work on improving our strong partnership with the College of Marin and a robust list of classes that our students can be co-enrolled in. We have a great program in Novato High and a new STEM program at San Marin. Uh, finally, although we're in a good financial position now, we need to be mindful of the future and the importance of living within our means. I'll work towards ways to we can cut expenses and increase revenues. I work. I will work diligently on these and other important issues. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Mr. Mack. Hi, my name is Greg Mack. 
Uh, I want to say thank you to everybody for being here tonight. It just shows great commitment to the community, which I think we all feel is very important. Uh, I've lived in Novato for almost all my life, 45 plus years, my wife as well. We both went to Hill Middle School, both graduated from Samarin High School. All my kids went through Novato, high, Novato schools, elementary, middle, Novato high grads. My daughter Annie here is in the audience. She's a junior at Brown. And my oldest is uh, pre-med in uh, Mississippi. My youngest, Connor, he is an eighth grader at San Jose. I'm doing this because I've been in this community and I really, it's really important to me and as well the schools are the fundamental piece of that and been recruited to do this for a number of years finally i'm going to do it because the time is right we have before us a transformation that we can uh, take place a convergence where a number of resources are coming together and i want to take advantage of that the time of the culture of scarcity is over and we can actually start growing again thank you thank you um, so we're going to move on to our uh, questions. Uh, so Mrs. Butler, you'll be starting off. What is the one action you have taken as a board member um, that you are most proud of? For challengers, what is one thing um, you most hope to do? Well, the most uh, thing as a board member that I think we've done really well is it's important to me that we're serving all students individually that they are, we're not serving, we're not a cookie cutter district or anything like that. So we offer, uh, I'm very proud of the programs that we have in the district, our STEM program at San Marin, our MSA, Marin School of the Arts program at Novato High, NOVA, our independent study program, uh, Marin Oaks, our continuation high school. So we have a variety of options for schools to serve that individual student. And that is the most important thing. And I'm very proud of the work that we've done towards that. Um, the second part, um, the challenges? Um, it was just for challengers, so people that haven't been on the board before. Oh. Okay. So just what you're most proud of. OK. okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hamovitz. Uh, hello. A as one of the challengers, um, let me take a second to just say, I think you should vote for Greg and me and bring some newcomers to the board. And I say that because one of the challenges is getting this board to do something in an open and transparent fashion. Ross talked about, you know, it's a pivotal year. A child only gets educated once. Every day is a pivotal day when it comes to education. And to talk in terms of years, and we're going to get around to it, and we should have done this, and it's all of this like in the future, woulda, shoulda, coulda. And it, what I want to bring to the board is actually attention to detail and activity to get the schools brought up to the place that they should be here in Marin County. Thank you. Mr. Millerick. The most important thing that we do in a school system is educate children and give them opportunities in their life when they leave here. The most recent thing that I have done in that regard is collaborate with the College of Marin. The CTE program is being expanded. We are connecting the auto shop program back to the college program at the high school. We are moving classes onto IVC so kids can co-enroll. So it's a chance for a student to take a class at high school and also get college credit so they can get out of college in three years and not four years. That makes it fiscally possible for some kids to go to school that did not um, and we have introduced, as part of that, this semester we've introduced Mandarin at, at Novato High. 24 kids are thrilled, and we're going to be introducing Evening Spanish at Novato High, and there's going to be a biology program next year. These are active new programs that are being implemented not four years from now. This semester, next semester, expanded uh, relationships, and we're going to work with Mike McGuire at the state to increase the um, amount of CTE money that flows to community colleges and we're working with UC Berkeley in order to get better connections for our school students here in Novato to those world-class universities that are just across the bay. This is not something we're doing some other future time. This is something that's happening now. Thank you. Mr. Cooper. Thank you. Um, I think the most important thing that I've uh, been, I think really the most important thing that first of all that we're up here for, where the school board is here for, is to give our kids a great education and a very strong and uh, uh, strong curriculum. So I think um, to that end I have helped facilitate uh, the bringing on of the STEM program at uh, San Marin as well as just ensuring that we have a very uh, rigorous program for every one of our students, not one group, not two groups, but all students in the district. 
Um, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the fact of lead, for leading that charge. Thank you very much, Mr. Mack. Yeah, it's pretty clear, and I think these guys know too, what I would want to do. My number one thing is invest, invest in the schools. It's a different funding par paradigm now. With the local control funding formula, we actually have a whole different world financially. The budget just three years ago was 61 million. This year it's 79 million. It's going to continue going up as long as ADA either stays st steady or it continues going up. We have the opportunity to actually invest in our programs, retain teachers, start doing a more overarching global overall approach to a solving achievement gap. We've been working on point solutions. All are very good, but we need to have a higher uh, look at it to put it together in an overarching program to see what works, what's not working, find the gaps. And last but not least, and I think everybody knows this, facilities. We need to invest in our facilities. While they're not falling down, and the existing board has done a tremendous job of keeping this district alive, those days are past us. We can move on now and start investing. The newest school in this district was built in 1968, the oldest 1952. We have a lot of work to do, and we're in a great interest rate environment. Invest. That's the key word. Thank you very much. Okay, so here's the next question. How do you plan to manage the rumored high percentage of teachers that will retire in the next five years and attract teachers to our district? Please be specific. We have a 15, per, I understand, we have a 15% turnover rate in Novato even before retirement. And part of this, in talking to teachers, is that it's not just about the money. That the district has a lack of respect for teachers, they feel hamstrung, they feel like they're micromanaged, and they're not being allowed to teach. I think there's, when you, when you wake up in the morning and you go to work, you want to look forward to going to your job. And I think having a teacher look forward to going in to teach is more than simply money. It's an attitude of respect. It's an attitude of, of coaching for achievement, of professional development and personal growth. And these are all things which, while money is a part of it, these are things which have to do with attitude, the attitude of the board and the attitude of the district towards the teachers. For too long now, I think we've treat, treated teachers as just uh, employees only, and yes, they are employees, but we really need to begin a dialogue of respect with the teachers in order to make it known that Novato is a good place to work, a place that you want to go to. Novato, compared to its neighbors, does not have the budget to pay the same salaries. We have to make up the opportunity for teachers to be able to have a quality of life for their family and a quality of academic opportunity f so that they will stay here. And while we have some turnover and that's being addressed, that's recent, we have had good measure of people who come to this town and stay. I got endorsed by the NFT because they believe I'm one of the people that can make it possible for them to have their careers and lives here. I have explicit conversations that says thank you very much. This is a chance for me to raise my family in Nevada and teach in Nevada. This is something that we need to work on. And it's true, we can't do it with dollars. We have to do it with other academic opportunities, training, quality of life. Um, we've done affordable housing at Hamilton. I was part of the team that put together, along with the board, uh, over 100 affordable housing units that teachers could occupy. And the, the school board inserted themselves in that conversation to make that opportunity available. That was an active role of the school board, not of the city manager or some other or the county agency. So we have been fighting for the benefit of our teachers so they have a quality life and can focus on the important issue that happens in the classroom and know that their family is well cared for and they have a quality of life. This is one of the most troubling and perplexing problems that we have in this district or challenges. We have some of the best teachers in, uh, in my opinion around. Um, we have a great reputation. Teachers want to come here. They come here. They like what we're doing. They like the programs that we offer. They like the professional development. Uh, the community and many teachers stay here and choose to stay here. They could move on, but they don't. Um, so we are funded differently than the rest of uh, the remainder of Marin County. That puts us at a kind of a disadvantage, big disadvantage. Um, I would be 
I want to find out different ways that we can we can uh, support our teachers, and that would be professional development, which we are already doing a substantial amount of. of. Uh, I want to increase that. I want to look at possibly doing some teacher housing over one of the parcels we have, one some property we have, as well as um, you know look at the salary. I think that's important to do as well. Um, one thing that I'm very proud of that this district has done, they've done a really, really good job. And, um, and that is promoting from within. We do some professional development and we do so much of it and we make our teachers so great that we promote them and we keep them here. And, and uh, I, I'm proud of that. I think we're doing a terrific job in that regard and hopefully it helps. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mack. This is one of the key topics that I'm running for because uh, turnover is unacceptably high. And I think we all know that, we understand that. Um, at Novato High, I believe we have 16 new teachers out of 63. San Jose, eight out of 24, 25. It can't go on like this. However, just like everybody else here said, we have structural issues. We are competing in an arms race against other districts that can pay a lot more. We could up our pay, but they'll up theirs as well. So we have to be more creative. We, we need to pay them more, and we're already starting to do that, but it's going to be more than that. It's going to be housing. It's going to be coming up with um, uh, plans that give them support uh, in the classroom so they can do their job. Common Core is very difficult to teach, and it's even more important now that we hold on to our teachers that we're spending so much money training them to do Common Core. That's, uh, so we, we, the last thing we need is to train them and watch them walk away, which has been happening all too often in the past. So in the end, holding on to our teachers is a key issue for me, and I've been endorsed by Novato Federation of Teachers primarily for that reason. Last thing I would point out is that we need to make the workplace with professional development, but also with technology, quote unquote, a cool place to work. They want to be here. There's more than just pay. There's an environment. Lee talked about this. I believe we're on the right track there. We have a new head of HR, and that is really uh, clearing things up, and it, we're, we have a lot of good things ahead. Thank you. Mrs. Butler? Outside of uh, the student being the most important to me, the next is our teachers. And we have asked so much from our teachers the last couple of years with the educational landscaping changing over the last few years, and we continue to ask more from them. So we've got to retain the teachers we have. We have to hire bilingual teachers. Um, we have to continue to give them the professional development. We are a great district. Teachers that don't leave because of pay stay because they love where they work. And that has been really important to us. And unfortunately, we've been able to give a salary increase the last four years. Um, we just did a 6% for this, this year that we're in right now and a 2% off the salary schedule. So I'm very proud that we were able to do that. Um, we need to continue to do that. We're still 15 to 20,000 shy of South Southern Marin, and that's where we leave our, leave, lose our teachers to. There's also a teacher shortage across the nation. And so it's not just affecting us with the depletion of teachers. Teachers are just, people are not just becoming teachers anymore. It's not a common profession that they really want to be in, and it's unfortunate. Because we've gone through the recession and everything, it's like, why should I become a teacher? Because it's last in, first out. I'm not going to be able to hold my job, and that is not right. Um, we really, I wish we could do something about that. That's a federal law, um, so I, there's not much we can do locally. So, um, and teacher housing, I'm all for looking into that. I don't necessarily want to be a landlord, but I want to provide some housing here in Novato for our teachers in some, in some way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, your next question comes from me. Um, so as a voice for students at Novato High School, I'm curious, um, how will you involve students perspective more into um, the, the decisions that the board makes. So um, I guess just getting our, our thoughts or, um, yeah. So Mr. Miller, please start us off. Student voice is something I've always hoped we would have. It's in, in, in a reg highly regulated structure that with the budget and the finances. Mm -hmm. um, there's legally, that's not an elected person, so they can't participate, but there's lots of other models. I was on student government when I was in high school, and we worked really hard to make sure we had a voice. And, and with our, under our new superintendent, we are bringing back student board members, and they are meeting with the student leadership council, so they're not just representing their own voice, they're representing the issues that are active on campus, and those are being discussed 
in our boardrooms, which is a change from a year ago. That's wonderful. Um, I'm looking forward to students having a stronger and stronger leadership, particularly at the high schools, because the, the nature of a high school education is it's it's the last chance to get this right because you're going to go off to a university where you're going to have to start fresh in a very new way and I, i'm hoping that we can expand the role of student government's participation and the student representation's participation in the direction this district takes thank you thank you thanks for the question uh, mr cooper good question and uh, clearly your involvement tonight is uh, hopefully something a sign of the things to come um First of all, our involvement, uh, we, for several years, we, um, many years, we had student trustees on our board. Um, then we stopped for uh, various reasons. Uh, this year, we brought them back. That's number one. Number two is uh, we're involving, there's a new process called local control. I'm sorry, L, the LCAP. And I think uh, you, will be, you will be an integral part, part of that and your opinions. And, um, and so the LCAP is essentially what drives this district. What uh, It's a three-year process, and um, uh, various parties participate in it, and that would include the students. Um, student surveys are really important as well, and we're asking actively. You, you probably remember a student survey recently. Um, that's just an example of we value your opinion. One second before you go, uh, Mr. Mack. Um, I'm going to ask the candidates um, to please try to avoid using an acronyms LCAP unless you explain what they mean please because we don't necessarily have an audience that knows all the <laughs> so that was local control accountability plan thank you mr. Cooper okay Sorry. thank you very much uh, mr. Mack yeah local control accountability plan basically reinvents the way we we get our funding and uh, it's, it's what's giving us so much more funding. Governor Brown signed it about three years ago, and it fixed the structural deficit problem we've had so long. But back to the question. Um, so student involvement, obviously, the board's done a great thing getting trustees in, engaged in the board. Um, they're actually sitting at the board now. And while they're not always engaging, um, I know the board tries to get them involved in the discussion, and that should cont continue. As well, though, um, just being a parent in the district, you actually get a perspective at the dinner table. You also get a perspective walking around with your kids and seeing those kids and their friends and their parents, and you hear things that you normally wouldn't hear. And that kind of involvement is hard to replicate, but at the same time, it can be if you get out in the, in the field and, and meet with kids and meet in the, the, the extracurriculars, which is really the only time you can because you can't go in the classrooms. So being at the extracurriculars, seeing what's going on, understanding what the kids' needs are and uh, what, what they're trying to do. Because it's the, the, the thing, and, and Debbie touched on this earlier, we need to be better at getting individualized with each of our kids. Giving a cookie cutter education is not going to work. We have to come up with a plan, ideally if we can, individualized for every kid because we have data now and also we can we, we need to find that one thing that makes every kid tick makes them want to go to school it's idealism I understand that but that's what we should strive for thank you yeah student involvement is is key is so important I'm glad our new superintendent has brought that back into our district so thank you superintendent Hogaboom for doing that and that was our opening day with staff what we did was we had the students come up and they gave us their thoughts and it, the teachers, were all every teacher in the district was there and they were able to hear from the students' perspective. It was great. Um, I'm glad that the student board member is back at our table. We have three student board members and we're trying to, I'm trying as board president to make sure their voice is heard and that we put the items that are important to them up front. So we hope to get your voice there. Um, student advisory at each high, each high school has started, which I'm very glad. And the, and the principal is using their student advisory to um, get feedback. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And to give that feedback, that's what we need. We can't just make a top-down decision at the site, at the district level. So it's important that the student perspective is there. We also have district advisory that we're just going to start doing, which incorporates the LCAP as well in that the engagement of our students, our community, and our parents is important. And we've done some surveys with the students. We need to continue to do that, but we also need to be with you, right in the same room with you, and get your feedback. 
Um, so going out to the sites to get that information from the students is important too. I think we can do tons of surveys, but we're not necessarily gonna get always the answer that we really want from you and you know the true answer. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hemovitz. This, this question is a subset of the larger issue of outreach. The incumbents all make this seem like this is a real uh, uh, big issue, that it's gonna be a difficult thing, we're gonna need committees, we need the student trustees, we need this. We live in the age of the internet. We live in the age of survey monkey and email. We live in an age where communication has never been easier. And you know, for one simple thing, the district should just have a suggestion box on the webpage so that if students or parents or anybody in the public has an idea, they can contact the district with an idea. The district sets up obstacles to community involvement. In this case, the community is the students. But with today's technology, it would be very easy to have a regular survey page for students every couple of weeks. Here's what we want to know about. Please respond. And to find out what the students are thinking. You know, of course, you're not going to get kindergarten students to respond, but I think the middle school, sixth grade on up, are perfectly capable of uh, having thoughts about district issues and uh, how they would like to see things play out. Um, I, again, w the district tends to live in isolation and make mountains out of molehills. I don't know why, but I think it's the thing that has to change. We need some fresh ideas, some fresh visions. Instead of developing a hierarchy of student committees and then principal committees and then filtering on down, we need a flat hierarchy where people just talk to each other and get things accomplished in an open and fair and honest discussion. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Um, it was an honor. Take care. Hi, I'm Bilal from San Marin High School. Uh, so to start things off, um, in the interest of finding out about the student voice, uh, please describe an interesting conversation that you've had with a Nevada student and tell us what you learned. Uh, who are we starting with? Uh, I think that would be me. Okay. So Cooper. if I'm keeping track correctly, I think. Um, a conversation uh, which comes to mind for me is when I recently, not too long ago, a week or two, visited Novato High's and I, High's, uh, I guess it's called the design class or studio in the back. It used to be the wood shop and um, I talked to the student who was totally, totally engaged in what they were doing. They had a teacher that was passionate about uh, what he was teaching. It was uh, design, uh, computer-aided design. They had machinery back there. The kids were programming. They were doing coding. These kids were totally engaged, and this kids just said how much they loved this class. They went on to say, you know, at the parade they saw this, and they just they just were totally engaged with what they were learning in that classroom. So that's a, that was a, a, a remarkable conversation for me. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mack. I had a conversation about two weeks ago asking questions about AP courses and honors courses and there's some genuine confusion out there about why honors courses are going away, what's going with APs, and it was indicative to me that we need to do a better job of getting across to the students, not just the parents, on why we're doing some things. I understand why we're doing these things, but the students don't necessarily. So that resonated with me in that we do need to do a better job talking about talking to the impacted students about the policy changes that we're making, especially at the oldest levels where these kids are only two years from making their own decisions. In fact, maybe they already are if they're being raised right. But that's, that, that was one that stood out for me. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Butler. So for 180 days last year, I had a conversation with two kids every single day, my own two kids, who asked me, what exactly do you do? Do you do anything on that board? Um, it was quite interesting. So they were always giving me some feedback and telling me, so I'm gonna go the easy route. My own two kids would always, I um, had constant conversations. The carpool is a great way to hear things. Um, a lot of it, you know, unfortunately, they need engagement. 
they need that engaging environment in the classroom. Mom, it was so boring. Mom, I can't sit there through 90 minutes on block schedule day. You know, So I'm hearing this feedback as a board member, and it's extremely important to me. I know we are looking, we are, we are doing better. We're not doing great, but we're doing better in that environment with the professional development that we're providing to teachers. Say kids want to be served differently. We can't just do the traditional classroom. And so those are the types of conversations that I've had and as Trustee, um, or Trustee Cooper and uh, Greg Mack has spoken to, I agree with many of their comments. Um, so we have some work to do. Thank you, Ms. Butler. Uh, Mr. Hamovitz. Hi, I, I guess I'm remiss in not mentioning I'm the father of an eighth grader at Sinaloa. Um, but as to the question about a conversation, <coughs> excuse me, I had a conversation with a student, which is actually one of the reasons I'm running for school board. He's in the information technology program up at San Marin, and he tells me that they have 12 computers, uh, four are desktops from the Stone Age, eight are laptops with broken keys, and it just was, was one of those brick-in-the-wall sort of conversations that brought light to the way the district runs things that we announce, a pro well, we don't because I'm not on the board, but the, the incumbents announce a program, talk about how great it is, but then there's no follow-up. So you have the information technology program, a class of 30 working with 12 computers which are outdated and broken. We need a board that pays attention to the details. It doesn't just announce a program, but actually follows up and makes sure that program is running. These sorts of conversations with students about what's working and what's not working are the essence of what's important to do as a board member because it's, where the, it's in the classroom where the rubber meets the road, where the students can give you feedback on how things are actually going. That is the most valuable feedback we can get. And for an information technology student to tell me that we don't have computers, which by the way, they recently got computers from Novato High, which are also eight years old, but for an information technology student to say we don't have it, th this is something that's important. Thank you, Mr. Hamovitz. Uh, Mr. Miller. Um, so you asked about a conversation with a student. So yesterday I spent an hour with a student talking about two things. We talked about his career goals, his, his uh, needs in order to get scholarship and the kinds of activities he should participate at high school and be involved in what kind of courses he should take. We talked about the College of Marin and the opportunities that we now have at Novato High so we can co-enroll and be able to earn their, their academic credits to move forward in that program and what you need to apply in terms of FAFSA and other academics. The other thing we talked about is his vehicle, which is a 1953 Jeep that his grandfather gave him, and we talked about the heads and the spark plugs and the air cleaners and the transmissions and the re improvements that he's made in the, in the, in the ride. Um, it was a great conversation, and he clearly has a very tangible feeling about what he wants to do today in his life today, and we had a great conversation about the things he needs to do to be effective academically so the doors will open so he can have a career. Thank you. Uh, so on to the next question. What should NUSD do with the San Andreas property? Mr. Mack. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, boy, that's a, talk about a softball. <laughs> Obviously, that is a dead asset. It's been sitting there since I went to Hill Middle School and my wife went to San Ramon School. It's, what, $25 million? It, or so, let's just guess that they are the value, is an asset that we need to leverage. We have needs. Teachers are leaving. Brandon Snyder, a great geometry teacher at Novato High, who was brand new when my first kid went through, taught my daughter Annie as well, looking forward to my young son Connor going into his class, he's gone. He had a win-win. He went, got more money to a lower cost of living. We need to address comp, and we are, but we also need to address cost of living. There are some folks that have some very good creative ideas on how we can leverage that asset and put it to use for our teachers. And it's, we, we have to do it. So I'll just leave it at that. I mean, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Butler. Yes. 
Um, I would love to see us do something with San Andreas. It has been sitting forever. I think it's 22 acres, and I know Ross can speak to. Um, there are many rules around what we do with the money that we get from it, and there's how we form a committee. To do what we, there's a lot of steps involved. I'm totally on board to, to look into it. Um, it's where it fits. You know, we do things when it when it's right for us and right for the district. We don't just do things because oh, there goes 22 acres. Let's do something right now. We got to do it right. And we've held off on many projects because it's the right timing. So like right now, we're looking at solar because it seems to be the right timing. You know, we looked at it four, six years ago, and it wasn't the right timing. So I'm all for doing something. I would love to maybe put some teacher housing there, some mix housing, and maybe some fields or something, park or, of some sort. But you have a whole community around there that would, we would need their input, absolutely, uh, the community around those 22 acres. Thank you, Ms. Butler. Uh, Mr. Hamovitz. Wow, nothing, nothing is probably more uh, a third rail than uh, building in an existing neighborhood. So absolutely, even from the very beginning, even from the discussion, uh, we should have neighborhood impact onto what should happen to that piece of property. Um, it would be lovely if we could, and I'm sure there are rules against this, as people have spoken about, it'd be lovely if we could put up teacher housing there so that we could give our teachers a dedicated place to live. Uh, it'd be lovely if we could put fields there so that our students have more places for recreation. There's a lot of possibilities here, but what needs to happen with that property is a lot of community outreach to make sure that if a decision is made, because we won't get a second chance to make the decision, that it's the right decision, that everybody's on board, and that the way the decision was made was clear and transparent and open to everybody so that you don't end up again with another boundary study or a closing of the Hill Middle School, so that you don't inflame the community by just raising a question. We need to make sure that people are on board no matter what ends up happening to that property. Housing, terrific if possible. Thank you, Mr. Hamovitz. Mr. Millerick? So the cornerstone of the conversation is San Andreas is a school asset, and the benefit, however we apply it, has to benefit schools. So the two areas that I think are applicable is teacher housing or playing fields, and I think we need a conversation in the community. I'm running for another four years. I would like in that four years for us to bring this to some resolution. In my tenure, we did teacher housing at Hamilton. We provided housing for over 100 teachers so they could live in the community that they provided, that they teach in. That was a clear direction by the school board. I, I was part of the initiative that made that happen. I think that same opportunity can happen at San Andreas. This is not new to me. The other thing that we've done that's important historically is San Carlos was also a, a, a property, and because of severe financial constraints in the district, we sold San Carlos for cash, and I think we got $3 million for it. And in hindsight, it's no longer an asset to the schools. It doesn't benefit anybody. It's some nice housing. We got the cash, but then the cash is gone. That kind of model of sell it off and take the cash and put it in the general fund does not preserve long-term value for this district. So we need to do something a lot smarter than that. And there's other examples around town where you can find schools that used to be part of the district that are no longer part of the district, but there's nothing left except a memory and an old scrapbook. We need to do better than that. Thank you, Mr. Millerick. Uh, now to Mr. Cooper. Uh, thanks. Um, so clearly it is an asset that we own. We, just to clarify, we cannot sell it for $3 million or more than that. We, it's a, uh, it, we need to do either lease it or use it for our own benefit. Um, so well, I, let me back up. You, we could sell it and we could, we'd be restricted to using that funding for uh, facilities and that's it. We couldn't use it for the most important thing. Uh, while facilities is important, uh, teachers and teachers, we've been talking about that all night. Uh, that's what's important. So we do have to do something. We have to get creative. So we can either lease it, we can build teacher housing. Uh, I'm in favor of doing the latter um, and in conjunction with other workforce housing for public servants, police and fire. And I think uh, clearly it's going to be a challenge. And clearly the school district does not need it any longer. It was a middle school site, a proposed site way back when he was in middle school. And, um, and it's just not needed anymore. We're slightly declining in our enrollment, so that's not needed. So I would support it. 
Uh, we need to use it for something positive, and I think part of that is teacher workforce housing. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so now for a question for me. Uh, how would you address the inequities in our school racially and socioeconomically? Uh, and on top of that, how would you keep the uh, bar high for everyone who is already um, achieving where they should be? Uh, I think we're at Ms. Butler now. Yeah. So equity and access is extremely important to us. Um, we've just signed on with the National Equity Project um, as a district, and it's because we really got to change the culture of the district, and that every child can be successful. That's the the opinion of every. That needs to be everybody's viewpoint. The teachers, the aides, the custodian. You know, everybody in the district, the parents, that every child can be successful. Um, so we need to, our low achieving kids, we need to provide those services that they need. They're going to need extra services. The high achieving kids, they're going to need more um, high, uh, what do I want to say, high achieving you know, courses and AP courses and we need to make sure we, we are providing that. For our low achieving, we've just hired the English uh, learner coordinator, which we've been looking for for over a year. We finally have someone we hired from within. She's fantastic. Um, that is a district, you know, at her, um, she's at the district office, so she'll be serving all of our schools in reaching out and how we can serve those kids better. We've just hired, or just did uh, an agreement with Kevin Clark Consulting to provide professional development to our teachers. So we're, we're in a number of things to work with our English learners. Our high achievers, we do need to focus on that as well. We cannot, and the, and the student in between. Um, we've got to look at that, and um, I know we've offered some additional AP courses at the high schools, and we need to continue to um, look at that, and I think the student advisory at the high schools is going to be a big play of that. Thank you. Mr. Hamovitz? It's the year 2015, and it sort of makes my heart sad to hear a board member say, we really need to change the culture of the district toward the uh, lower achieving students. It's like, what have we been waiting for until now to change the culture of, of the district? It's this, this idea of, we always have a new program, we're all, there's, it's the woulda, shoulda, coulda once more. And we need to get new board members who actually have a sense of urgency about this and who push to make changes that result in a difference in the district. As for the high achievers, you know, this again is a woulda, shoulda. Everybody talks about the STEM program. The STEM program only served 60 students. It was wildly popular, but the board was unprepared to roll out more classrooms to serve more students. So once again, we have this lack of attention to detail. This stuff is simple. It just needs to be done. We just need to focus on the students. To take over a year to find somebody to liaison with the, with the uh, English learners, uh, I'm glad they kept looking, but there's no reason that they couldn't have done this in the year 2010. There's no reason that this couldn't have been done years ago. And so once again, to my ears, it's a system of just, well, we mean well, but there's a reason we couldn't do it. And it's that way over and over again. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Millerick? The, the first thing you need to do to solve both the equity issue and the high achiever issue is to have great teachers and solid academic programs. And we are doing that in this district. We've got new leadership that's moving us faster in that direction. But if you look at Eileen Smith and the work that's happened at Loma Verde, they have extraordinary test scores. They run an algebra academy on Saturdays to help the kids that are in trouble in terms of what they're learning. The kids who are capable have come in and helped those kids. So student helps students, parents help students. We have the raw material in this district to deliver high academics. Once you've solved the academic issue and you've got that under control and we are making great strides, you then have to address the equity directly. We have uh, brought in the National Equity Project. There's specific funding in the state funding formula that targets that population. We're using that money to the tune of over $100,000 to bring in and make every teacher and every administrator and every secretary aware of the institutional things that we do that blocks kids from being their most successful. We have um, Superintendent Hogaboom gave me an example in the community he came from. He had one kid who's, whose parents are farm workers, but the kid went to Yale on a full ride scholarship because he takes great pride in making sure the barriers are removed. 
that's the same thing we need to be doing here. That's why he was hired. That's where we're going. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, Mr. Cooper. Yes, I think this is, uh, this is nothing new, as I think has been mentioned. It's been an ongoing challenge for us. Um, we've got a very diverse population. We've got um, uh, many challenges, so it's hard. You know, we're not uh, completely homogenized here. We've got a lot of different levels uh, in our district, and we need to address every single one of those. We need to, we've been talking about the achievement gap for, I don't know, a long time. And so we've also got lower achieving kids in the district. We've got higher achieving kids. So we need to address both of those. I'd like to see the higher achieving kids uh, being challenged. And to that end, I want, I'm happy to say that we have the STEM program and uh, a great performing arts pro liberal arts programs at, at, program at Novato High. And I'd like to see the College of Marine co-enrollment uh, grow to challenge them. I think we're doing a lot with the uh, lower achieving kids um, local control funding formula, the LCFF, for those who know, um, it, is, uh, it is geared towards giving us additional money to those students that actually need it. And so uh, that's great. I also think we've got PK, we've got AVID, we've got many, many programs in place. We're working diligently. We've got community liaisons, and uh, we clearly know that this is a concern, and, and I'm, I'm for uh, moving everybody up. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Mr. Mack. Yeah, so the achievement gap is real. Um, I, th I think we were thinking we were making progress at one time. The recent results came out, and unfortunately, the achievement gap is wider than we thought it was. Uh, and I'm in violent agreement with everything everybody's saying here, but I believe we need to go further, uh, reference a number of point solutions. We need to put them together in an overarching program. We need to look at overall results as opposed to individual results. One of the points, the key things to bring up here is, and this is almost, we need to educate our parents as much as we do staff and teachers in the difference between equality and equity. They're two different things. Just giving kids the same thing is not gonna work to close the achievement gap. We have to, we have to scaffold up the kids that need more help. We have to challenge the kids that don't need more help. We have to, and that's where teacher training, professional development, and Common Core really comes in, and that's why, once again, it's so important to keep our teachers because we're going to have to put a lot of money into them to make this work. So in the end, it's about really, and I think Debbie touched on this, getting more individualized with our approach to, te to teaching kids. No more cookie cutter. We need to work with each kid to build a plan to get them to where they need to be. Last but not least, we need to be careful about tracking. The last thing we need to do is tell a kid in sixth grade that he's not good at math. We need to be, give that kid a chance to be good at math by the time he's a sophomore or junior. Thank you. Uh, so that's it for me. I'm done. <laughs> so weren't the students great, everyone? It's so nice to hear from both of you. And you they came up with those uh, questions on the fly, so that was quite impressive, gentlemen. Thank you so much. So now it's my turn. So I'm going to ask you to. We're going to go a little. Um, I'm going to ask you to go a little deeper into the achievement um, gap conversation. Um, because what I've heard so far this evening, we've talked. We, we keep talking about the STEM program and the MSA program, and that's high school. And if you haven't been prepared um, before you get to high school, you have access issues. And so one could argue that we have um, access issues in both of those programs if we looked at the demographics in them. So during the League of Women Voters debate, when you were asked about the achievement gap, only one of you spoke about some of the institutional barriers that exist in NUSD that is part of the root cause for the achievement gap. So I'd like you please to identify some institutional barriers that exist here at NUSD and discuss what you think could be done about them in order to contribute to closing the achievement gap. And who, I think it's Mr. Hamovitz, Mr. Hamovitz, you're first, thank you. Oh, big, big answers and little answers. Little answer. We need a full-time translator on site at the board meetings. 
There's no reason that a Spanish-speaking parent can't come to the board meeting and make themselves understood to the board. If it weren't for board member uh, Maria, Ak Ak sorry, Ak Aquila, thank you, the, the board would be just it, it would be staring at the speaker, not knowing what to do. So small but simple answer: put a translator at the board meeting. On a larger level. My son attended Linwood, which has a lot of Spanish-speaking uh, students, English learning students. And we really need to make the district a family. We need to open our arms and tell people that they are welcome. There's a real palpable sense that a lot of the parents of the English learners, not to paint with too big a brush, but I am, are somehow afraid to get involved with the system, that, that they feel like they're not welcome. We need to make sure, maybe it requires the board members going door to door on a weekend and knocking on doors and saying hello to people, but we need to make sure that we welcome people with open arms, that people understand that this is a safe place, that they can come to us with problems and questions, and that the school district is here to help them and to help their children succeed, no matter what interests they have. It's a matter of open arms and, and of changing the, the culture that keeps people at arm's length. Thank you. Mr. Miller? The specifics are a little tricky because they got kids' names tied to specifics, but in with a little more generality, um, Eileen Smith at Loma Verde ran an algebra or a math academy. This was to teach fractions to fifth grades. It ran on Saturday. It wasn't a help you class. It was an academy class to honor kids' special needs. And in that program, and I participated as a Saturday tutor, not every Saturday, I didn't have the time, but on the ones I could. Um, and the, the, the key to that activity is that you learn the need of the individual child. You have enough adults in the room, if it's a dad or a mom, but you have adult attention saying, okay, they can't, they can't figure out this fraction problem. With that kind of specificity and understanding and not saying, oh, you got a C and that's okay, or a B and that's okay, you need to teach to understanding and you can do it with one-on-one -on -one education, but it takes the extra effort. And they've had the funding and they also had the academic leadership on that campus for that to happen and they still do. Um, we've lost Eileen to the county office, unfortunately, but her legacy is rich and wide. Um, my daughter teaches school, and on the first week of school, she does a deep dive and looks at the kids' grades clear back to fifth grade. She knows 150 kids, everything that they succeeded in and failed in, topic by topic, grade by grade. You can teach individual kids how to succeed. And if you can't do that, then you discover a kid's got a language barrier or they have a cultural barrier. So I'm, so, thank you. Mr. Cooper. Thank you. Um, so big problem or a big challenge for us. Um, and I think many of the things, um, I think it's really important not, it's important as in any level, but at that level it's important that we track kids and students and keep an eye on them. We don't want, we don't well go over in the corner and we're gonna you teach yourself or you'll whatever. I think um, it's it has to do with differentiated instruction, map testing, formative testing along the way, keeping track of the various kids that need need help. Um, it has to do with uh, outreach to parents. I think it and we're doing that. We're doing our our site leaders are doing that. Um, it has to do with food and nutrition. It has to do with kids coming to school and getting some breakfast. So there's a lot of things. Um, and I think just tracking them and, and monitoring progress along the way does wonders, and that's uh, education. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Mack? So you want institutional. And unfortunately, we, we do have some institutional barriers to the very problem you talked about. Um, and it's unfortunate because I'm a huge backer of MSA. I also love STEM, but I just recently figured out that there is no applications in Spanish. Um, same with GATE. Why is GATE so white? Let's face it, there's just as many English learners out there that are special as, as there are uh, non-English learners. There's some fundamental things we do need to address. And we can, it's just a matter of doing it. And I think we have the right leadership team to do it. They're gonna embrace it, but we need to recognize it to your point. Now, beyond that, 
I've lived it. I'm the poster child for who got sucked into this whole thing at one point. I had a child that was at Loma Verde. Loma Verde was struggling. We took the bait, went to Rancho. In the end, it wasn't a big deal, but it didn't seem like a big deal. Then we started realizing what we did to Loma Verde. We left our neighborhood school. Now, when Eileen came, Ross has been talking about Eileen, we lived that. Eileen did miracle work at Loma Verde and opened all our eyes on how you can do it. You don't have to use English learners as an excuse that you can't perform. You can when you do it right. And what we learned from Eileen is the way to do it. And that's one of the institutional things we need to embrace. Thank you, Mr. Mack. Ms. Butler. OK. Um, God, I lost my train of thought. Um, so the achievement gap is not only an academic, formed by academics, it's also um, how, it's also the barriers that students face outside of the classroom that creates the achievement, back, achievement gap as well. Um, they, there are faced, there are students that are faced with many obstacles outside of the classroom and we have to serve the whole student and that's providing services. So just to give you an idea, I have, because I kind of keep track of this a little bit at each of our schools, because each school is their own community. They serve their students differently. So like for Hamilton, um, in, in serving their community, which is a high uh, Hispanic uh, demographic and English learner demographic as well. So they do a lot of outreach and being connected. And they have the Hamilton Mothers Group. Uh, they have a tech support for parents after school. The library is open till 4 o'clock for homework help. There's parent workshops at least once a week. They have an open closet. They have a family market. They have uh, counseling. They have English classes for adults. They have a bilingual liaison. So there's a multitude of services that are there that are going to hopefully squash these barriers that are out there to create this achievement gap because it's not only the academics that creates it. Um, the governor just vetoed a preschool a bill that was access for all eligible um, access for all eligible students um, that are, aren't enrolled in, in transitional kindergarten. We need a preschool at every elementary school. Now that's one you could all talk about for a long time. But yeah. Thank you, Ms. Butler. Okay, so I'm going to take us in an entirely different direction now. We've talked um, about the students, and we've talked about the teachers, um, and I'd like to hear you all talk about. Um, the role that you think um, our classified employees play, the important role that they play in our district, and where they fit in this um, challenging puzzle of um, compensation and respect and um, working conditions and, and those kinds of things. I believe Mr. Miller at here first. So as a, as a framework, my grandfather served as a classified employee at Santa Rosa JC and managed their very elaborate garden for years and years. The notion that um, we as a whole community educate the child from the, the first person the child sees, the office manager when they walk in the door, and the respect and, and, and the dialogue that occurs between that individual and the student and their parent to, to the dialogue that occurs on campus um, throughout the day. Um, our classified people are mature, grown adults and have in many ways mature points of view that they can share with children during the course of the day. Uh, we need to make sure, uh, and we have in some cases and not so in others, make sure that, the, that from yard duty to front desk to janitorial staff, everybody conducts themselves at a very senior level and understands that their, their models, their role models for the children that are in their environment. And we need to, ha and, and the counter of that is we need to have a re the same respect and bargaining with them and their union as we do with the NFT. I, would, I believe in our new leadership that that's going to get better. We're going to have a more collaborative negotiating model and collaborative support for children model on our campuses. That's one of the things I'm hoping for for the next four years. It's one of the reasons I'm here, because I believe that's going to be the truth. So I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cooper? Thanks. Um, our classified employees are equally important to as everyone else in this district. There's no difference. Um, they, are, they perform, teachers do, do a job in the classroom. Uh, classified employees, uh, some of them come in contact with our students and, and play an equally important role. So. I think um, 
We do respect them. I think we have tried to remain in negotiations uh, when we when we talk about salary increases and conditions, etc. It's very important for this for me that they get treated. If there's a raise for one group, they the other group gets it as well. So I think that equity shows a lot with this group, and I think uh, we've got a very good pretty good relationship with the classified right now. But I think they play a really important role and probably underspoken. So the, the classified employees are a big part of the, the, the teacher environment. The, the teachers cannot do their job without the classified staff doing their job. They need the support. And once again, we, we know that we've had some very severe budgets in the past decade and a half at least. And getting more funding in to help build that support is key. Once again, invest. Invest in supporting the teachers. Invest in supporting the campuses and the staff. As well, though, we've gotten into this culture where we have kind of an individual campus-by-campus campus approach to classified. Uh, one example I've learned that kind of freaked me out is on the IT staff. Each campus has its own IT person. Now I know this is probably going to change, but that's how it got, where we had an IT person reporting to a principal who really had no idea what to do with this person, but they know they needed them. And when I talk with the, the new head of IT, a gentleman who is fantastic, and we're, we're really lucky to have him because he comes from San Francisco Unified, he's a CTO, he has a plan for matricing that organization, or we'll see, it's up to Jim. but. Uh, the idea is to have a much more common approach across all the campuses for technology, as an example. And because of all the budgets and the way we've been uh, running on really very thin funds, uh, we weren't able to do that. Each campus is on its own using categorical funds. Now we have an approach where we can actually build an infrastructure for the whole uh, camp all the campuses together. Thank you, Ms. Butler. Classified staff plays a huge role in our district, and I've said this before, they're the glue that holds this district together. It's the attendance clerk who collects all of our attendance and which gives us our ADA, which gives us our funding from the state. We have the bus drivers who get our students to and from, our special ed students. We have the yard duties. Um, we have the office manager who does everything and anything except for what's on her job <laughs> description, it seems like. Um, so they're very valuable to us. And again, it's the glue that holds us together. I, I hope that we can move towards uh, interspace bargaining, which we have been able to do with our teachers the last four years. It's more collaborative. There's norms that come together, and you just establish so much more, and a more rapport with each other. There's no this combat, combating back and forth, which really isn't with classified, but you don't want to get to that point. You want to have a constructive uh, conversation. I hope we can get there. They deserve uh, increases just like our teachers do. They are really hard workers, and I, I appreciate everything that they do. Uh, hi. Is this all right? Hi. Um, I think it's telling that the incumbents pretty quickly move to it's an issue of money. Whereas Greg and I have, uh, maybe I'm putting, I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, have more a feeling of like, this is a resource. The classified people are a resource. And it isn't, uh, yes, they, they probably deserve more money, but they are the people who, if anybody's ever worked in an office setting, you know that it's the people who make the office function who actually have the best idea of what's going on. And to that degree, the classified personnel are a great resource for the district to, le to listen to, to learn from, to find out what's working, what's not working, what things could be changed. There's got to be lots of low-hanging fruit in this district that would make things run more smoothly if we just knew about it. But there's no way to actually uh, ask for input from people who are working where, as I said, the rubber meets the road. We should make it easier for the classified people to have input into board decisions. Uh, at least we should hear them out about more and more issues. Again, we, because we're strained for money, we have to take advantage of every possible resource we can. And if people understand how a school is functioning or not functioning, those are the people we should be listening to. We can't afford to not listen to anybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next question is about technology. Technology is not just limited to equipment and what the teachers use. 
NUSD is lagging in general in providing technological related curriculum to a wider student body. Do you feel this is needed for our student body? And if so, how do you plan to address the issue? If not, why not? I believe um, uh, I Mr. Cooper, yeah, time. Tom, it's, it's to you. So technology, <clears throat> I think to answer the question directly is very important. I think um, we're preparing our students. It's our charge to prepare our students for 21st century uh, learning and living. And I think part of that, that's the, we may as well face it, that's what's uh, the technology is something that they're going to need to know um, into their lifetimes and their lives as adults. Uh, we're going to clearly, um, it's part of the instructional, the tools when they come to class, they have uh, their own devices sometimes. All the, we need to have computers uh, for them. But I think uh, teaching about technology and utilizing uh, technology uh, in classrooms, you know, we have online learning, we take the Khan Academy, I've seen that used in various uh, instances. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Thank you, Mr. Mack. So just a quick little background. I'm a technology executive. I've been working in technology for the past 20 plus years. I've last eight years in, in startups. So technology is near and dear to my heart and my, my checkbook. Um, so obviously this is a different world. We're in the 21st century now. And teaching programming skills is very close to becoming something that's core that kids need to learn. We need to offer that, maybe not just as an elective, but maybe as something that a kid can take as part of their, their path to college. Whether it's Java, HTML5, uh, C, C programming, database programming, there's all kinds of it out there that right now our kids really don't see till they get to college. And there's a lot to be said for letting them dabble in that, dive into that, play with that in high school. Now we're doing it to a degree already. Glenn Covey's uh, a design class at Novato High in MSA is fantastic. We also have a programming class in STEM. We need to take what we're learning there and expand it beyond just the MSAs and the STEMs to make it available to the other kids, the kids in the middle who might want to do this. And quite often, these kind of kids don't go to college. They go straight into programming and they make good money because it's a very valuable skill. So we need to understand that and we need to work with that and make it part of what we do for the district, for our kids. Thank you, Ms. Butler. Technology in the classroom and part of the curriculum is extremely important. Uh, that's what kids want, that's what we're hearing. They want that engaging environment, the stimulating learning environment and part of that is having technology. Our PTAs have put out tons of funds. You all know every parent in here has contributed to putting, um, uh, What's it called? Chrome cards. Chrome cards or iPad iPad cards in the classroom. And thank you very much for doing that. We've realized at a district though that that is not right. And we need to find, this is something that is needed across the board at every school is technology and the district needs to find a way to fund that much more, much better than what we are doing. So we're looking at that right now. Um, it was mentioned the product design class with Glenn Corey at Novato High is hugely successful, huge. And that is all techn technology related. Our broadcast studio is sitting there at Novato High and needs to be used. In some way, I think they're sort of working out something that they can work with the College of Marin to get that up and running. So um, that's important. I think Novato High is also looking at a coding class for next year. So things are coming down, they're in the works, and this is, we're in a little bit of a transition year right now and um, with some of this stuff regarding technology. And it has to be in the classrooms. At Hamilton, every student, every middle schooler has an iPad and they know how to use it and it's regular, it's part of their day. So it's, it's at our schools, at some of our schools, we need to expand that, maybe starting with some of our middle schools, we start where every student has an iPad. Thank you, Mr. Hamovitz. Our automobiles have computers. Our refrigerators have computers. There's absolutely no question that our students need to learn the rudiments of programming in school. It absolutely needs to be mandatory. And this doesn't mean deprogramming, but it means to have some passing familiarity with the logic of programming, with the logic of how machines think. Above and beyond that, uh, talking to Sean, who the new IT uh, director, who's a great guy, and I have great hopes for him, 
The students should also be learning how to work Excel and learning how to work Word. These are industry standards. You don't go to work in a business in America today without needing to know how to, how to operate Word and how to operate Excel, and probably PowerPoint also. There are things that we as adults do every single day, and then we look at the children and the students and we say, oh wait, we're gonna teach you like it's the 19th century, like you're still making buggy whips. Technology is one area where we can flash forward the district. We can have individualized instruction for students. We can teach students programming. We can make sure that students who don't want to go to college but instead want to work in the automobile industry, they're still going to need programming skills. A machinist who works on a machining, on a milling machine, still needs to know algebra and, uh, and calculus to operate a CNC machine. This is a critical thing that we need to move ahead with as quickly as possible to get our students familiar with technology and programming in all aspects. Thank you, Mr. Millerick. We absolutely need to have technology and programming in our school district, but there's multiple dimensions. The first is we should be teaching C++ and programming, which we did 15 years ago and we have stopped and we're going to restart. Everyone should learn Office, Word, Excel, all those tools. We did that, and I believe that's still going on at the high school. But it had, in the past, every high school senior got that information. That needs to be continued. But more importantly, not just the technical skill of how to use a Microsoft computer in order to do some office work. We need to be using computers to drive academic content. I've invited the superintendent and our IT director to join me in a visit to San Domenico. San Domenico teaches grades three through 12, one-on-one -on -one iPads to every child. They're better funded than us, they're a private school, but they have the model perfected. And we are taking the, our leadership out and we are going to review how that's done. I hope that this by the end of this year, we have at least one sixth grade class, one-on-one -on -one iPad, so we start practicing that material today. More importantly, it's not just the skills of the technology. We need to have the visionary kind of thinking that I can see a problem and I can solve it. Um, and lastly, what's key in this district and we have done over the last decade is build an infrastructure that we can afford to deliver this because we have high-speed network and we can manage this stuff centrally. Okay, thank you. Okay, it's been a long, warm evening, so I just want to let everyone know, we're, I think we're at the last two questions, so hang in there with us a little bit longer. Um, this last question is kind of a, allows you to maybe go into more detail um, some of the things you were talking about just now. I'm gonna make it into a two-part question. Um, there's been a constant push, and we've heard it for a number of years, about getting kids to college, getting kids to college. Um, and how, here's the two parts. How do we address the needs of the students who aren't going to college? And, and that is okay because they're more suited towards or want to go into more trade type um, careers. So that's the first part of the question. And for the students that are going to college, are we doing enough in the way we design our programs and prepare our students, not just to get them to college, but to prepare them so they will graduate from college? I know that's a lot in 90 seconds, so that's do the best okay. you can. <laughs> I, I want an easier question. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mack, you're first. You guys have heard me say this a few times. So, um, all right, so college bound. Not every kid is college bound. It's great that we train them, prep, prep them, they give them the opportunity, especially the kids that grow up in families that don't have college in their culture, in their family. That's critical. But even families where everybody's went to college, there's that kid that maybe doesn't want to, maybe wants to be an artist, maybe wants to go build houses, maybe wants to uh, you know, be a musician. Anyway, we need to understand that. We need to work and provide that spark that gives the kid the reason to go to school, especially in high school, that where they're just getting close to that launching point because there's, it happens. Kids, and it kind of jumps in the second part of your question, is that kids go to college and realize college isn't for me. And then they flounder, and then basically parents spend money, and the kid never graduates or ends up going into a trade anyway. So we need to embrace 
all the different possibilities. And I think uh, Maria brought it up at a board meeting a while back. What do we do about the kids in the middle? And that's exactly what we need to do. We need to, once again, give every kid that individual opportunity, that spark to go to school, whether it's during the classes or extracurricular after school. It's something that keeps them involved. Ross has talked about IVC. Wonderful programs going on there. We need to take advantage of that as well. It's not just college, but college obviously is what we want to prepare them for. Thank you. Should they want it. Ms. Butler. Yeah, we're, we know that not every student is going to go to college, and we have to prepare them for either college and career. Um, one, the, the piece of the puzzle that is so important to me in, in achieving either one of these is our counselors at the high school. Um, I've been kind of harping on this for a while, but I, do we have enough? Do, are they effective? Um, those are things, those are just two questions that I don't think we, we've addressed. And um, the counselors is the key to guiding the student through high school from freshman year to senior, to getting them on the path, to opening them to opportunities that they didn't think that they, they could do. So try out this AP class. Go do this product design class. You know, what are you, what do you like? You know, the counselor needs to meet with the student more than just twice a year to set your schedule for the following year. Um, I, and I'm a little, I, it's just so important that we get this right. Um, maybe it, we've talked about having middle school counselors, um, getting counselors even at the middle school to start engaging students, just introducing we need to do more parent outreach in regards to this is what you need to do to get your student to college or to a career. Our new superintendent came from a district where he implemented career tech pathways. I would love to see that. So a kid finds an interest that they like and that they can take a couple classes on that path that interests them. Or if they don't, then they move to another track. So there's a lot of opportunity for us here that we can make a difference. Thank you. Mr. Hamovitz. With, with technology and individualized instruction, there's no reason that every child doesn't necessarily need to go to, doesn't necessarily need to go to college, but that every child can't end up coming out of high school with a career path in mind. School is the beginning of your path in life. It's the opportunity uh, takeoff. It's the takeoff for opportunity, and it it is uh, with the community we have here in Novato, the volunteerism, we have every opportunity to expose our students to a wide and varied array of possibilities for their life. There's from automobiles to the Buck Institute to nursing, there's a whole array that we can expose students to. But this would require more community outreach. And it's the sort of thing that we should take students, right now we do community service for high school students. Frankly, I'd rather see, instead of community service, high school students having to go shadow somebody to pick a work, to pick an occupation and shadow people so that they can get a better sense of what's involved in that job. Years ago, when everybody just lived in the village, everybody saw what everybody did. Nowadays, we need to make sure that students actually are taken out by the hand and exposed to different possibilities. I think the community outreach involving students in possibilities for career is one of those things that the board plays a significant role in creating. Thank you. Mr. Miller? I absolutely agree the board plays a key role in making sure that our students have choices. That's why I've reached out to the College of Marin and made sure that the programs that are there are available on our high schools. That's why we're in looking at reinstituting the aeronautics program using the material that was developed 10 years ago at San Marin and re-implemented as an ROTC program so we can increase that enrollment and create great kids the opportunity to move into the aer aeronautics industry if they want. That's why we have uh, electrical apprenticeship programs that are based at College of Mar Marin IVC campus that allows kids to move forward into those careers and go into a full apprenticeship and we should be partnering with the, the crafts and the construction industry in this area. Those are things that we should all be doing today, some of which we are, some of which we're building on as we go forward. The issue of success in college is a different story. There are a lot of kids with valedictorian 
that go to college and come back with their tail between their legs because it's a lot different than they thought. They're, they, they're, they may be the smartest kid in their high school, but all of a sudden they're in class with every smartest kid in every high school. All the valedictorians for a thousand campuses across California are now sitting next to them and they're not prepared to apply themselves to the kind of work that they have to do. We need to make sure that study skills and discipline and focus are part of the skills that we give our kids. That's, that's almost like a citizenship course, but it's how do you work. Thank you. And Mr. Cooper, I think we finish up with you. I'll wrap tight up here. I think um, our job as school trustees in the school district is to prepare anyone, prepare all of our students to go to college. Whether they want to go to college or not, they're prepared. We've done our job. We've said, okay, we're going to prepare you. If you want to go to college, great. We've, uh, we've prepared you for that. I think to that end, um, we need to monitor, stay close to the kids and make sure, you know, that the kids that need something aren't, don't fall through the cracks. Once again, um, I think in conjunction with, uh, aside from, if you're not going to college, I think there's other opportunities. I think we need to, it's our job to also touch students with many different opportunities. So let them experience the robotics class at San Marin. Let them experience some uh, veterinary sciences class at College of Marin. All of these things help make a student make a decision. So I think it's our, our job to prepare them for college, but offer them, show them many different opportunities. Um, am I out of time? Okay. And I also think we need to prepare with the kids going to college. I think we need to do our due diligence. And once again, it's monitoring, I think. Um, and that is our kids, many of them get to college and they're taking remedial classes to make up what they should have learned here. We need to make sure that doesn't happen. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. And um, last question. With a seven member board. Yes. No, not quite. With a seven-member board, no decision will get made unless four of you agree. And while a culture of a 7-0 voting history does not necessarily best serve the public, a board that works together effectively does. So what leadership style do you bring to the table that assures that the issues will be thoroughly considered and debated if necessary while maintaining a productive board culture. And I believe Ms. Gosh, Butler, you're you used all my time up with just saying the question. Just saying the question. <laughs> just to go back on the last question, I just but I read an article in the Time magazine about P, uh, SAT scores and ACT scores where colleges are not accepting that anymore, which I found very interesting. Um, which might be the way to go. And let's look at a, a student for the full four years of their transcript and see a pattern of how they're doing instead of just one score, yeah, or an essay. So just to tack onto that. Um, we are, we seem to be, yes, a 7-0 board and vote 7-0. For me, myself, I'm okay with that because I, one of the things I do when I got on this board, I said, I need to know what is going on in the classroom. I can't just sit behind that desk every two Tuesdays a month and make a decision um, on items brought before us without knowing what is happening in the classroom. So that is what I do. So when I sit there, I'm very comfortable with the decision I've made um, as a board member. Um, we all have disagreements at some point. As the seven members board, we, we disagree. But in the end, we all pretty much want the same thing. What is best for kids? In the end, that is it. We do have some disagreements. Um, and I think it's, I, I'm not opposed to a 7-0 vote if we've, if we've all done our homework. we got to do our homework as board members. You can't just show up and go rip with your board packet that night, Tuesday night. Um, we've got to make sure we do our homework. We know what is happening. We ask questions to our staff. We get clarification. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Mr. Hamovitz. Here's where I probably stand out more than anybody else. I, as part of running for this office, I've visited other school board meetings and seen how other districts are running their board meeting. Novato is an outlier. We have a district uh, board meetings where questions don't get asked of staff, where people seem to take everything personally, uh, I, and I don't understand why. There's a lot of districts which run things in a professional, matter-of-fact, it's-nothing-personal way. 
where I'm asking a question just to get information, not to question your ability to perform a job. I think that we need to change the culture at the district office so that when staff presents to the board, that board feels free to simply ask questions as to how something got arrived at and that it doesn't become an issue. The board meeting is the public's process. The board is the governing board for the district and the meetings are where the public interest is supposed to take place. And if we have a board that doesn't feel comfortable questioning staff in open meeting, then the public business is not happening. And as a result, everybody's being kept in the dark about what's going on. This is simple stuff. It's about being respectful, being friendly, being professional, and just asking questions to get to the bottom of something. Um, I will probably disagree with everybody about how they think the board meetings are running. I think the board is isolated and has become an extension of staff, and that needs to change. Thank you. Mr. Miller. Well, no one's actually ever accused me of being in the extension of staff, so, so I, I guess that's a new role for me. Um, the decisions that we need to make need to be the very best decisions we can for 8,000 students. We do not need to spend our time haggling over issues or minor issues. We need to make sure the information that comes forward in, in the development of the topics, which sometimes takes years, sometimes just a few months, is well done and well documented, and the information that's presented in public is so high quality that a 7-0 vote is possible because it's clear the work has been done at the ground. The decision that we talked about earlier about solar panels, it was not the right thing to do six years ago. Everybody agreed. Technology's improved. Funding's changed. It's the right, probably the right decision now. We'll know soon. So the, so I do not want to model what Mr. Bonner has modeled in the U.S. Congress as a model for us to get together. I want to make sure that we collaborate and find a common ground for how we can move the school forward. And that is about kids, not about the board to conversation. I'm proud that we have a seven-member board. It, it requires us to do a lot more work in preparation for the conversation. Small boards can get off on the tangent. This board is slow moving in terms of those decisions because we're big, but it's it's, it's uh, important to me that we, the 7 0 vote is a, is a mark of our, our achievement, not of a limitation. Thank you. Mr. Cooper? Uh, you're absolutely right. While we do come to 7 0 votes many times, um, as, far as, as far as I'm concerned, I come to the meetings prepared. I, do, I read my board packet, I talk to staff, I ask questions ahead of time. So. I've done the research ahead of time, and I feel like I've come to the meeting pretty well prepared. We do have discussions and debates about certain issues, um, and clearly we we have had less than seven zero votes. Um, I'm not I'm one to not be predisposed to any any particular decision. I come to a meeting. I'm objective. I come to a meeting with an open mind, and I I want to hear all the facts and evidence, and then I make a decision. So. Uh, whether it turned out to be 7-0, uh, for me, I made did my due diligence. Thank you. Mr. Mack? Uh, first, a little bit of background about me, because I'm not an incumbent, so you don't know where I'm coming, I'm coming from. So I spent about, uh, shoot, eight years on the San Jose leadership team, uh, four years on the Volatile High leadership team. And then, also in new sports, uh, there's nothing like a Little League board with 20 board members. So talk about diplomacy. You, need to, you do not have 20 votes, well, rarely. And there is a need to listen, just like Tom said, and be diplomatic and open to new ideas because you don't know everything. And both professionally and in my um, community dealings, I think I'm pretty strong at that, at listening to what other people have to say. But I'm also pretty vocal, and you're seeing it right now. I'm very proactive. So I'm not the type of person that's going to be reactive. I'm going to be trying to pushing the envelope, hence the, the idea of investing. I really want to get us from good to great. I think we can do it. We have the resources. And last but not least, maybe there is something to be said for the occasional 4-3 vote. Maybe there's something to be said for five board members. That's been brought up. I'm open to that conversation. Do we need seven board members? It's a remnant of the merger of San Jose, uh, school district in Nevada Unified School, or the Nevada School District would create Nevada Unified. 
it's it's a discussion worth hearing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, that wraps up the question part um, of our evening. So now, um, if you would like to give, a, well, I won't say brief because we've allotted three minutes to your closing statements. So Debbie, you can make up for that, the time that was lost in your opening. Um, I have heard you give quicker closing statements than a minute. So if you want to take pity on your um, audience, um, please do so. But. Mr. Hamovitz, I believe we're starting with you. So, closing statements. Thank you. Hi. The fundamental way I approach this is that you get only one opportunity to educate a child. They grow up and they're gone. And it's important that we have a sense of urgency about this. That this isn't just, we have a program of 20 kids here, we have a program of, of 10 kids over here. The board, like I said at the beginning, is a lot of woulda, shoulda, coulda. It's a lot of ribbon cutting and no follow up. And I know that it's unpopular in Novato to speak negatively, but at some point, you really need to uh, illustrate what the issues are. The issues are, we need more community outreach. We really have to open up our arms to the parents of, of uh, everybody in the community. We need to open up ourselves to the community at large and partner with the community in more new and different ways. Every question that's been asked here tonight is an issue for the board. And if you think back over the answers, it's a lot of like, oh, we're doing okay, we're doing okay. I don't think we are, and I think we really need to move forward with fresh vision and fresh ideas. And I look for your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamovitz. Mr. Miller? I'm, I'm running for another four-year term. This is an important four years. We have the money, we have the leadership, we have the academic standards to meet, and we have the technology opportunity We have a, uh, to extraordinarily move forward the kind of program we can offer our kids. And part of that is we have examples tonight. Students are involved in their own education represented here and represented on our board. We have a new way of looking at the world. This four years is gonna be an extraordinary four years. We have STEM, STEM programs coming forward. We have MSA programs in place. We have partners with a, with a <laughs> pardon me, I'm having a dialogue down okay. here. We have partners with the College of Marin <laughs> in terms of expanding programs there in order to allow kids to get through their academic careers faster, uh, less costly, and more directed to the interests that they have. Lots and lots of solid academic work is being done. Lots of solid staff work is being done. This is an, a very exciting time, and I'm thrilled to serve you for the next four years. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Mr. Cooper? Thanks. I'm grateful to our student moderators tonight and also to School Fuel for hosting this event tonight. Novato Unified has had some challenges over the past several years. However, under this board, under the current board's leadership, we position the district to have a strong financial footing, as well as making strong improvements to the educational environment or achievements of the, to our students. With a AA plus credit rating, only 15% of the school districts in the state have that or higher. We've demonstrated we make sound decisions. This is an exciting time for education. We've hired a new superintendent who's an exceptional leader, or I should say an exceptional educational leader. Our teachers are embracing the new Common Core curriculum and taking advantage of a lot of professional development from the district. We must continue to grow our science, technology, engineering, and math programs at uh, uh, San Marin. I would like to see more programming co classes like code writing uh, classes at Navarro High. Mm -hmm. To accomplish these things, we need more classrooms and facilities tailored to those programs. We have a diverse population. Uh, much has been accomplished in the last four years, and I'm, uh, I would look forward to uh, having your vote. Thank you. Mr. Mann. I'll, I'll kind of keep it really simple. Three primary focuses. One, teacher retention, investing in teachers and staff. How do we keep them after putting so much money into them and maintain the continuity that we need to teach our kids and to grow with all the new requirements coming through? Number two, the achievement gap. What can we do from, away from just point solutions but an overall plan for achievement gap? 
Right now, we tend to focus on a one-year plan at a time. Let's look further out. Let's look five years out. Let's look three years out, whatever it takes to get beyond just the initial ideas that we've got. And there's a lot of good ones, but we need to put it together in an overarching plan. And last but not least, and we haven't talked about this hardly at all tonight, infrastructure. Our infrastructure is old. We need to take a long, hard look at how we can address that both from a technology perspective, even though, as Ross points out, our backbone is really strong, we need to invest in it, but last but also as well, our hard facilities, both buildings and even fields. Thank you, Mr. Mack and Ms. Butler. Um, well, thank you everybody for being here tonight. This is probably the best turnout I've probably seen in one of these, and I attended a few. Um, thank you to our student moderators. It was great having you here. Your voice is very valuable to us. Um, just know that I'm committed and knowledgeable. I listen to all viewpoints, and I'm prepared to do my homework as we move forward, and I hope to serve the next four years. As Trustee Cooper said, this is an exciting time in education and challenging at the same time. There has been a seismic shift within the last two to three years with the new Common Core State Standards, a local control funding formula, the local control accountability plan, and the new state testing. And Nevada Unified, along with the board leadership, have embraced these changes and continues to provide strong academics through high quality instruction. I'm very proud of our district. We've had many things to accomplish. We've talked about a few of them this evening. I thought we had more time. We do. I, I'm not sure you're doing okay. all three. So I'm going to keep going. Same. We're all getting the same. Yeah, I'm hot too, but I'm going to keep, keep going. So these are some of the things I'm really proud of. STEM and MSA, which is uh, at San Marin and Marin School of the Arts at Nevada High, is growing and improving by meeting the needs of students along with our other programs, as I spoke earlier. Integration of technology is, is district-wide and in the hands of students which heightens the NUSD academic experience. We talked about that. Professional development is providing tools for our teachers to be successful and our instructional coaches, which we did not talk about, uh, provide teacher support daily. We face the Great Recession along with state funding that didn't support education to the tune of being underfunded as a district of $50 million. It was the board's priority to keep as much of the impact away from the classroom. We have formed partnerships with Boys and Girls Club, College of Marin, and Marin County Library, just to name a few, that we can't do a lot of the stuff we do without these partnerships. Our staff has received a salary increase the last four years. Our summer programs provide continued support to targeted students, which we did not have up until a couple years ago. And most importantly, our focus is the student and that every student deserves to graduate with the knowledge and skills that ensures that they are prepared for college career and to be global citizens. So I hope to ser uh, serve you as a trustee for the next four years. Thank you. Okay, we had a little mix up with the timekeeping for, and so I just wanna give the other candidates an opportunity. If in listening to that long list, if, if it brought up anything for anyone else to, to add, I invite you now to do it, but give me a little signal so I can call on you. Mr. Mallory. Briefly, please. I, I think um, President Butler has summarized the work this board has done well for the last four year, a year and, and four years. Debbie, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody? Anybody else? Or are we okay? Okay. Thank you. That was a long evening, and I want to thank all of you. And obviously, there are some questions we didn't get to. There were a lot of really good questions, and we tried to pick questions so that it would touch of a range of subjects. Some of the questions were in similar families of questions. Um, I encourage you all to um, direct your questions that did not get asked um, to the candidates directly. There's going to be a brief meet and greet after. We've got some nibbles and cold drinks in the kitchen. Um, School Fuel will be posting the unasked questions on our website, so I encourage the candidates to look at them. So you can see what your commute enough side talks, and I'll see, you're going to get an idea of what happens at the board table. So choose yeah. wisely. Um, we're going to post the questions on the School Fuel website. I encourage you the questions that did not get asked. So I encourage you to look at them so you get an idea of some of the things that your um, community is concerned about and wanted to hear about from you. Um, thank you again to the Quest Church and Novato Community Television. Um, thank you to our challengers. And the reason I um, want to thank you specifically is I believe, as do the community, that contested elections better serve communities. It gives communities opportunities to ask questions um, about what their governing bodies are doing and make informed choices. So thank you for providing us with a contested election. Um, 
and the students. You added a really nice component to our evening, and I appreciate you. Um, I didn't read you all the bullet points on their fabulousness because we had a time limit tonight. So they are very busy young men, so thank you for um, adding us to your schedule and contributing to our evening. So, Excuse me, one more thing. Can you mention Cindy Clinton? Oh, oh yes. Um, I, I don't know if you're all aware, but you probably figured it out given um, what it looks like at the table this evening. Cindy Clinton has pulled out of the election, but she decided to do that after the ballots were already printed. So technically, she could still win her seat if people just vote incumbents in without doing their homework. Um, so I just want to point that out to you, um, spread the word so that people know to do their homework and vote for the candidates that are running. Thank you. Oh, oh wait, oh, I'm sorry, wait, wait, one more thing. I didn't give you the dates that this is going to be rebroadcast in, in case you want to um, share with friends. So on channel 26, which is the community access channel, it's going to be running every Saturday at 5.30 until the election, and every Thursday at 8.30 p.m. On the Education Channel, which is Channel 30, it's going to be running every Monday and Wednesday at 5 until the election, and every Saturday at 12. So, thank you. This time we're really done. <laughs>